everybody to what is now our, our second annual Lundell Prize panel discussion. I'm Professor Peter Calpino. I'm the Professor of Economics here at the College of Charleston and the Director of the Center for Public Choice and Market Process. Uh, the Center for the Public Choice, uh, Center for Public Choice and Market Process mission is to advance the economic, political, and moral foundations of a free society. Um, I have a friend and colleague of mine several years ago who uh, advised me to do a panel such as this as he uh, instructed me and, and advised me that it was always worthwhile to reach out across campus, um, have important conversations about events that go on besides just what's in your building, in your classroom. Um, and so uh, today, like the Nobel Prize, prize of themselves, right? We are going to be able to talk about the liberal arts and sciences, right, and bring them together, which is the way that we try to do them all the time here at the College of Charleston. Um, I'm joined by six faculty from across campus uh, who are going to tell you all a little bit about each of the Nobel Prize winners. Um, and so let me go ahead and do a quick introduction of each one of them, and then I will turn it over to them to let them explain about uh, the particular recipients and the relevancy of their work. So for the Nobel Prize in Physics, we have Associate Professor of Physics, Dr. Gabriel Williams. For the Nobel Prize in Chemistry, we have Assistant Professor of Chemistry, Dr. Michael Giuliano. For the Nobel Prize in Medicine, Associate Professor of Biology, Dr. Anna Zumman. For the Nobel Prize, Peace Prize, uh, we have Instructor of International Studies and the Bennett Director of Mars Global Leadership Institute, Dr. Max Koboloff. With the Nobel Prize in Literature and uh, Chair and Associate Professor of French, Dr. Lisa Signore. And for the Nobel Prize in Economics, Professor of Economics and Director of the Office of Economic Analysis, Dr. Frank Kaplan. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Williams to get us started. We'll take the note. Thank you. So afternoon, everyone. So my particular talk. All right. Good. Okay. All right, cool. My particular talk is on the Nobel Prize in Physics, and you're looking at a photo of the three physicists who were awarded the Nobel Prize back in 2022. The way I like to describe what they've done is through this picture called entanglement. And entanglement is by and far the most, uh, the strangest and most controversial discovery associated with quantum theory today. And the point of what I'm going to do today is to give you a sense of how we introduce it. And I'm going to focus my attention primarily on Alain Aspect and John Clausel's work just for the sake of time. But here's going to be the nut and bolt part of this actual talk. In short, the three winners of the Nobel Prize in Physics actually verified the strangest prediction that we know in quantum theory. And that's why their result is now very popular for us today. I'm gonna to start with a thought experiment that is pretty simple. Let's suppose you close your eyes, you threw a bunch of balls in each of those particular boxes that you see there. And suppose that one of those balls was black, one of those balls were white. You basically put them in a box, you didn't know what box was which, you mixed them up, you basically flew one to the moon, kept one on Earth, and you basically want to ask the question, what is the probability of finding one, let's say you open the box here on Earth, what is the probability of finding one of the balls in there to be black, and what's the probability of finding the other one here to be white? And probably your answer would be the common sense answer. If I have two balls, one black and one white, I basically got a 50-50 chance. That makes perfect sense. And that's basically what you would say. Now, the question is, and this is kind of what entanglement basically raises is, is the information about the balls that you just looked at, did it exist before you opened the boxes or did it exist after you opened the box? Your common sense would say, of course it happened before you opened the box because you can't change the color mid-flight. That's what you would come to that conclusion with. This is what makes entanglement strange and complex. So now what I'm going to do is take this analogy and put it in quantum mechanics language. Let's suppose that instead of having colors, black and white, we treat this as a quantum system. 
And so in terms of the standard understanding of quantum mechanics, the way that we would describe this particular situation would be as follows. Before the box is open here or here, we cannot know anything about what's going on in either box. So for instance, if we said that the box, the bolts in the box had different colors, what we were basically saying quantum mechanics is we can't actually know what those colors are until we open the box. Now there's something even stranger in what's happening here. And this is the following statement. For a quantum system, what quantum mechanics actually says is not only can we not know what's in the box beforehand, it also says opening one box causes the other box to have a different color. Now, that is completely counterintuitive to most people. And that raises the basic question, why would anyone come to that interpretation of what is actually happening? And the answer to this question is actually a long-standing simple answer, because this is actually the interpretation of what quantum mechanics means. Quantum mechanics means that the actual state of the system is known only after you measure it, not beforehand. So in the picture that you see here and here, what we're saying is that it's only when we open the box that we actually see and actually know what's actually happening. And more than that, once we open the box, as you see here in the actual picture, that is when we actually define what is white versus what is black. Now, here's the problem. When quantum mechanics first came out, all sorts of people thought this was crazy for good reason. The most important one is Albert Einstein. Einstein said, it's impossible for you to say that opening this box forces a new prediction over here, because that would mean information is traveling faster than the speed of light. That's basically impossible to do. So Einstein completely rejected this idea, and he argued that whatever quantum mechanics is saying, it must be interpreted differently. It must be wrong at some fundamental level. And now that's going to basically raise the next series of things we're going to talk about. Quantum mechanics. In a nutshell, when we talk about what quantum mechanics predicts, it basically says that everything we know about any physical system at the micro scale level is quantified by one thing called the wave function. In simple terms, the wave function tells you the probability of a certain system state of existence in some way. Now, here's the issue. In quantum mechanics, whenever you have two or more objects interacting with each other, like those two boxes you see on the screen, quantum mechanics says, we know the correlation between both of these boxes, but we don't have information about the specific state of box one, or the specific state of box two. We only know how they're correlated to one another. So that means if, for instance, if we had information about what's in box one or what's in box two, what we are saying conceptually is that we have more information about the system than what the wave function itself predicts. Quantum mechanics says that cannot be. All the information of the system is contained and that special wave function idea sign. And so what the Nobel Prize winners of our uh, 22, uh, 2022 basically demonstrated was that the standard interpretation of quantum mechanics is actually correct. It's not wrong. In other words, Einstein is wrong about this. Quantum mechanics happens to be correct about this. And here's how this is demonstrated very quickly. Back in the 1950s, there was a scientist named John Bell. John Bell is more of a mathematician and statistician, and he derived a series of theorems to test whether or not Einstein's idea was correct in which there are hidden variables that govern a system, or if the standard interpretation of quantum mechanics is correct. That became known to us as Bell's theorem. And Bell's theorem says there is a relationship statistically between the measured properties of any particles that are entangled or bound together. And he derived a series of equations. I'm just showing these equations just so you can see that they exist. 
I'm not going to explain all of what they mean. The main point is that there is one relationship if Einstein is true, the top one. There is another relationship if quantum mechanics is correct, the bottom one. And basically, for the first time in the 1960s, we now have a way to test who was actually right and who was wrong. And that leads to what the Nobel Prize winners were basically speaking about. The first test of this theorem is based upon our first Nobel Prize winner, Alain Aspect. He verified this back in the 1960s. And what he did was to actually construct a device that is able to determine multiple particles correlations and determine whether or not Bell's theorem actually applied. Here was a kind of picture of what that looked like. He produced a bunch of particles like photons and he sent those photons through polarizers. Think of your eyeglass, your polarized eyeglasses, basically. He knew at that time that if some photons go through one polarizer, you would get light coming through. If you go in the opposite direction with the polarizer or reverse, you get no light coming through whatsoever. And he basically repeated this multiple different times and multiple different orientations. And what he convincingly showed was that Bell's inequality was violated. In other words, there are no hidden variables in this experiment. That means quantum mechanics is working exactly as we predict. And it says that Einstein is definitively wrong about his statement on hidden variables. Now, this was the first major test to do this. But the basic issue that happened in terms of the history of physics is that they noticed even though there are multiple polarizers here, Foster, in this case, and Aspect, both realized that in terms of the overall aspect of the system, these polarizers are basically not really well put together. They basically are fixed polarizers. And the idea is, can we reproduce this experiment using polarizers that are randomly oriented? And that is what Clauser's kind of test basically meant to do. So because I'm over time, I'm going to stop here. But the main point I want to kind of emphasize here is that their actual work demonstrated that you can construct a system that can actually test the actual entanglement of particles using simple polarizers, collecting photons, and measuring how they interact with each other. And both of them demonstrated that Einstein was defensively wrong in his predictions, and standard quantum mechanics is correct. And that leads, in terms of the history of physics, to a whole bunch of future questions. What does it mean to say that particles are entangled no matter where they are in the universe? Does that mean that the universe is deterministic at the core? Does this mean there's no such thing as local existence and locality? All those other questions come later on, and that leads to basically the philosophy of science changes with quantum mechanics. So I'll stop there. That was, that was super cool. I mean, such as I get, that was really the quantum mechanics and using the abbreviation and not the equations and all the rest of the molecules. But it's, uh, our general opinion that explains everything. Um, and we were just talking about it. And, uh, so, that, that was really cool. so um, my name is Mike Tuliano. I'm going to start off. I'm going to hand out two molecules. I want you guys to pass it around. Those in the middle is a ring of five atoms. Three of them are blue for nitrogen, two of them are gray for lactose. Right, we just pass them around, and I do this to make two points. One, organic chemistry is not an abstract science, simply of molecules and things we don't see. The way the organic chemist looks at a molecule is as if it is an object, a tactile, real thing that we can construct, just the same way we ask our students to build models in class. Now, that way is special because what you are holding is a model of something that doesn't exist in any living thing. And that's at the heart of a, a major portion of this year, of last year, rather, Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2022, that there are molecules and chemistries that exist outside the realm of the chemistries that exist in living organisms. And that if we exploit them properly, we can understand something very fundamental about living things. All right, we'll get there in a sec. There you go. Okay, so the Nobel Prize in Chemistry was given for the development of click chemistry and biorobotical chemistry. 
It was uh, given in equal shares to uh, doctors Bertozzi, Melville, and Sharp. Um, and what we're going to talk about is some of the contributions at the beginning were as much philosophical as they were scientific. And I'd love to begin this by thinking of some quotes from Dr. Bertozzi's work, um, which has served as quite an inspiration in my own career, and that is that chemists are dreamers. We think of new molecules and we bring them to life. <laughs> and that's a bit of a loaded sentence when she said, because she doesn't just mean we're going to make things or we're going to try to make something that didn't exist before. We bring our understanding of how molecules interact with each other and with living organisms into the development of new medicines and into the, in, in, into the uh, social improvements of, 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 of humankind by whether it's commodity chemicals or medicine or, or diagnostics. Right, we're getting, you know, chemistry is at the heart of all this. So what is click chemistry? It has a fantastic onomatopoeia. And the, the, the analogy chemists love to use, and this is what the Nobel um, Prizes uh, practically shows, is that this graphic of a seatbelt clicking a shot, where you have one piece and another piece, and you just snap them together. And it comes from a philosophy of, uh, of, of chemical synthesis put together by Professor Sharpless at the turn of the 20, 21st century. And what he said, was that with a few billion years in a planet at her disposal, nature has had both time and resources to spare, but we as chemists on a human time scale do not. And this was actually a really controversial statement, and it was a great way to take a fight as an academic, because synthetic organic chemists love to look at really complicated molecules, things that look like you, you, you said a three-year-old loose and a bit of Legos, and build something wild and said, let's make that. Now, they often have amazing functions, but it might take 15 years to figure out how to make it, an army of PhD students, and you might only be able to make one milligram, which if we're thinking about quantities isn't enough for a single dose, depending on what the substance is. So how on earth do we get to molecules that have useful functions with quick chemistry, and how do we make it economic? If you were to think what drug pricing is a major common issue now, right? And the economics of that go into largely, where does the money get spent? If you have to purify a molecule, with 10 times the weight of the molecule in, in, in chemical solvents, it's not a, it, it, that step will never fly in a drug market, right? In terms of the supply cost of making even one metric ton of, say, ibuprofen, that would, that would be the inhibit our ability to make it. So we need chemistries to be really useful. It's not just what the molecule does, it's that we don't have to work that hard at the end to get the useful piece back down. Okay. And so you define what a click reaction must be. Modular, meaning you take lots of different pieces. It doesn't just work with one molecule. It works with nearly every combination we can. So compatible with many building blocks. It has to be cheap. We must, it must work in very high yield. We don't want half of our starting materials left over. We want all of it going product. And ideally, all of the atoms in each molecule ending up in the product. We want everything to be non toxic all right? We don't want complicated conditions. You, know, you can make the world's best catalyst but if it's hideously expensive and the reaction requires a, a, a PhD student with you know, five years of training to run it, it's not going to work. It's not going to be, it's not going to be an act of society. And you want it to work in non-toxic solvents, ideally water. And again, like I said, you don't want to have to spend all your time figuring out how to isolate your molecule at the end, how to purify it. Right? And so what I've shown here, this is the reaction that's the star of the show today. And it's an azide, three nitrogen bonded together with one possessing positive, one negative charge. So this molecule is sort of loaded reactivity-wise, if, if we have charges, that represents electron imbalance. It's overall neutral, but some of the atoms in it are a little bit more reactive than some of the others. And, when, and, a, and a functional group called an alkyne, which is, it looks like three lines equivalently, that is it's a carbon-carbon triple bond. And if you put either of those near each other in the presence of a copper catalyst, you make this five-membered ring. And if you look at the five-membered rings I passed around, it's the same shape. No living system. No to us, so yet makes those. And what's amazing is the chemistry to make those does not happen in any living system. It works in every living system, and it doesn't interfere with them. And so what I'm going to tell you a little bit about are some of the little snapshots of the stories that let us do that, that let us come up with a molecule that can interact with and makes make other molecules that can interact with living systems. So basically, it's just a linker. It's just a seatbelt. It's putting together the important components of this. So that's what click chemistry is, reactions that create molecules with beautiful properties with easy conditions, easy to use conditions, cheap building blocks, no impurities, and you can get the molecule out at the end and actually use it for something. So it was a way of re-envisioning how we make molecules. Okay, and so the way we do this is we would take an azide and an alkyne, and 
Nobel, uh, the Nobel laureate who, who came with the idea of plate chemistry was Professor Sharpless, and he and uh, a colleague uh, from Valerie Fogan worked together very hard to try to figure out how to do this with copper catalysis. And remarkably, at the same time, University of Copenhagen, the Melvin Laboratory, also was working on this. And they worked on it in different ways. In Sharpless's case, it was showcasing how easy the reaction was to run and what you could get back out of it. And in Melville's case, he showed that whole host of molecules that have biological properties, like polypeptides that we find in medicines and other really important molecules uh, of, of that nature, were tolerated. And you could actually stick other pieces onto them to give them new properties. And so I show on the right an excerpt from a review article here written in 2008. I don't expect anyone in this room to be an expert in device organic structures. But it looks like stick figures. But the idea is this, no matter how complex the molecule was, over the course of just the very first eight years of this reaction's application, they, they were able to um, uh, uh, modify anti-tumor drugs, antibiotics, antiviral compounds, dimerized vitamins, and any host of bio, uh, molecules that interact with biological systems. And what, they, what you could attach to it were things that either gave the molecule new properties and better potency, say restore activity to an antibiotic, which has become which has developed resistance, um, or allow us to see a molecule and to light it up and make a molecule suddenly emit light so we could see where a living thing it happened to be working. Okay. And so this was the, the, the development of this reaction. Um, you know, thousands and thousands of papers to, 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 to sift through if you want to try to read about where it came from. Um, but the take home is that it interacts and allows us to make molecules that were already complicated, even more so. But with chemistry, they can be done literally mixing two things open to air in a flask of water. But what would it take to do this in a living cell? And this is where Professor Bricosi's that they um, uh, development came from. She noticed, well, chemistry is easy to do. Professor Meldau goes and works on molecules we find in living things, but it work in real living things. And the idea was this as Living organisms develop. The surface of our cell changes. This is important not just for understanding organismal development, uh, and, um, but also for say understanding cells that develop and are factor into the rest of our cells, say a cancer cell. What changes about its surface? And so, using a model organism on a zebra fish, I propose you show that their metabolism would tolerate a carbohydrate building block with an enzyme, feed it to a cell, and then at different time points, take this molecule here. Now, all of a sudden, the molecule reaction does not require a copper catalyst. Copper kills cells really, really well, really effectively. But if you take this molecule here, this, the bonds of this molecule are bent out of their ideal shape. And because of it, once they undergo the reaction, they go to a lower energy state. So the reaction is very favorable. What happened to accept the figures by bringing back the logic of plate chemistry? And so what happens is if you take a developing organism and you pulse it at different time points with another piece that has different color what we call fluorophores, molecules that emit light in different colors when we energize them. We might be able to differentially image how cell surfaces change during the growth of an organism. And that's precisely what these, these drawings here are showing. We see green, and then we see red and some yellow mixed in. Three separate colors mixed in at once, telling us that at different levels of organism development, the sugar molecules on the outside of a developing organism change in real time. Right, and as a young graduate student, when you see this talk being given, and then the professor shows you a movie of a, be a beating and developing heart in an embryo and waves of color watching across every distinctive sugar molecule on it, you realize we're seeing something that shouldn't exist. We shouldn't be able to necessarily look at that. But we're walking with a distribution of different molecules that differentiate tissue in real time by chemistry that can be done simply by mixing something with a pipette like you might learn in one of our undergraduate. And so it changed our ability to see molecules around the world. Um, there's a slide here that is uh, missing. But the long and short of it is that at this point, there is no biomolecule that exists that has not been functionalized using this chemistry. Right? There is no biomolecule, there's no uh, aspect of the biomedical industry. And as of last year, we now have reports of our successful first two clinical trials in humans of an anti cancer drug that has been made more selective and less, less prone to side effects in working in humans because of click chemistry. Is it only attaches itself to tumors when it gets there because those tumors have been equipped with one piece of the two components necessary to do a reaction like this? And as a, as a, as a conclusion here, Dr. Patozzi, you know, we say when our field rock stars become rock stars. Um, the day, you know, when she was awarded the Nobel Prize, of course, as an undergraduate, she played piano. And she happened to be a rock band with Tom Morello and Rage Against the Machine fan. 
they won the battle of the bands. It's called Board of Education. Um, and so this ended up being the, 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 uh, every chemist ever was celebrating and nerding out on the Twitter exchange here. But Bertozzi gets, uh, Dr. Bertozzi, I think, gets her, her, her fame from something else that's really important. This isn't a part of my own identity, but um, Professor Yinu, who's a very prominent and renowned chemist, was a member of my thesis today. And Dr. Bertozzi was the first out chemist many people knew about and has spent her career not only revolutionizing how we can literally see chemistry and living things, but also bringing along as many people as she could and opening doors specifically uh, for women in science. We wanted eight women to win the Nobel, Chem uh, Nobel Prize of Chemistry of nearly 200 laureates, and for members of the LGBTQ uh, community, as she's the first uh, known member to have, uh, uh, to have won a, a, a chemistry Nobel Prize. Now, Professor Eden says this much better than I can, and that uh, if I were an example, you realize that all of these assumptions you've internalized about what was possible and what was not, they simply weren't true. And again, this was not a part of my identity, but my career as a chemist was vastly impacted irreparably uh, uh, by, by the fact that we have, have such an amazing member of our chemistry community, um, not the least of which was someone who probably who asked me phenomenal questions once upon a time in my own thesis sense. Right? And so um, science being done at, at a role changing level, but also being. So thank you very much. So today I'm going to talk about the Nobel Prize that was awarded in medicine, and that was awarded to a Swedish scientist by the name of Svante Pavo, and he actually did not have to share his prize with anyone else. He was awarded just to him, and it must have been quite amazing for him to receive the Nobel Prize from the king of his native country to actually go there. And so, question. I love the Nobel Prizes probably because my mother is Swedish and I spent so much of my childhood in Sweden. And so every year I try to get my students really excited about the Nobel Prizes. And so I give them this monstrously long homework assignment where they learn all about Alfred Nobel and how he invented dynamite. But with the caveat that this is really exciting, if we have a Nobel laureate that wins a prize, in the topic as a class that I'm teaching, which I teach immunology or molecular biology, that cake is on me and you can celebrate as we should. So here we are this year. We were delighted in my class that we had a Nobel award. We had one the Nobel Prize that his applications of what he studied profoundly could be connected with immunology. And we were so excited that I convinced one of my colleagues who shares an office in the same hallway, Dr. Renaud Gessling, that the party should continue into the next class, which is molecular biology. And so our students got both cake and popcorn that week in two different classes to celebrate uh, the science that Santo Pablo won the Nobel Prize. Riveting stuff. He wrote this amazing book if you're looking for like a summer read. And what he was able to do and why he won the Nobel Prize is he was interested in maybe a tale as old as time. The wonder and the questions that he wanted to answer. He had long had an interest. He's a little bit of a probably overachiever. He went to medical school, then he went to do his PhD. And while he was in his PhD program, he was studying viruses and immunology, he decided on the side that he was really interested if he could isolate DNA from mummies. So unbeknownst to his PhD advisor, he did these secret studies to see, you know, what he, about DNA. And in his lifetime, it seems like all of these interests and passions converge in this overall question of what makes humans humans and how are they different from other bipedal perhaps extinct human like forms that came before us. And so he has been able to link these questions. Well, does the past genetically affect the present genetically? And what do we carry on into the future? And how might that relate to communities? And this question of where do we come from? His initial probably what he spent the most time for like 40 years trying to answer was this question of if we have like our people say this would be us here 
skeleton of what we might look like. The closest extinct relative to us would be that of the Neanderthal. And the Neanderthal went extinct about 50,000 years ago. And so he wanted to know genetically how similar were we to this dead end branch of the family tree. Well, he was born suddenly, was born at his golden age of genomics and DNA, how to sequence DNA. In the last 20 years, we've been able to sequence the human genome. Some of us walking on this planet have had our own genomes sequenced, and technology has enabled machines and computers to do a lot of that work. The question he wanted to know was, well, could I use this human genome sequence and make a comparison to that of the Neanderthal? Well, he had some huge obstacles, and the biggest obstacles up until that point, nobody had isolated DNA from something that was extinct. And he was thinking, I want to isolate DNA from something that thousands of years ago. And if you would talk to somebody from like a biology lab or maybe like a forensics lab, the fresher the DNA, the better it's going to be with your results. Uh, which you can't be jumped into a DNA sequencing machine and expect this wonderful stuff to come out. And so he really had a seemingly impossible time. We know that if this was, and this is not a man, this was a good human, that the moment that tissue starts to die, the DNA degrades. And why that is, we have enzymes in our cells that basically act to chew up the DNA, to break it into all kinds of pieces. And it does seem that it's possible to maybe get little parts of broken up DNA in bones and teeth. And the reason for that is bones and teeth are typically not wet. Now, when you have things that are wet, it degrades. Think about if you threw like a dead chicken, you just let it sit there. Really, it's going to degrade. The proteins are going to degrade. The um, DNA is going to degrade. The best way would probably be to put that thing in a freezer. Okay. Well, unfortunate to Sante, Neanderthals were never found in the permafrost. So we didn't really, didn't really have any frozen samples to go with. But what we know about the fact is that maybe if it's not wet and bones might have a places within them that aren't wet, but the DNA basically almost mummifies on the existing bone that might be present there. So he started with this, but he had lots, lots of trials and tribulations of trying to get intact DNA that would be able to be sequenced. So we have this contamination going on. Clearly, if a Neanderthal were to die, be buried, he looked at samples that had been <clears throat> taken from caves, from open areas, samples that might have been burnt, bones from museums all across the world to try to see if he could isolate some of this DNA. And part of the problem with he could isolate DNA, but the majority of the DNA here to be bacterial DNA or modern human DNA of the people that have found these bones that have um, basically contaminated it. And so how is he going to tease that out? And I'm not going to go into DNA sequencing because that could be a fascinating lecture in and itself about different ways that you can sequence it. But he was able to overcome a lot of those trials and tribulations and was able to, in fact, get Neanderthal DNA sequence both the mitochondrial and the nuclear genome, so all the chromosomes of the Neanderthal, be able to do a comparison to humans, found out it was about 99.7% the same as what modern human DNA would look like. But in 6 billion bases of DNA, that little bit of difference could actually be quite substantial. And some of the questions that people have been putting on the is if we look at time and we look at like we're the modern humans, homo sapiens, or so all over this planet, we ended up um, went extinct about 30 to 40,000 years ago. There was a substantial time on the planet when they coexisted. 
And so one of the questions from the fossil record that people really wanted to know was, were they breeding with each other? Were modern homo sapiens breeding with Neanderthals? And if that was happening, was there genetic flow? And was, were some of those genes retained? And you know, if you think about what was going on for people in those time periods in Neanderthals, if they were had a shared distribution, some of the thoughts were, well, gosh, if there was interbreeding going on, the only way we'd be able to show it would be genetically, because we can't go back in time to reconstruct that. But might it be that if there was interbreeding that was going on, that it created sterile offspring? And that oftentimes happens with different genes that species or two species can breed, but you get an offspring that cannot. And um, so you have this with that type of fish, if we think about like making donkey and horses and making rules, they cannot breed. And, but he was able to show, and his group was able to show that yes, in fact, there was gene flow that was going on, which would be indicative of breeding that was going on in these times where they overlapped and they did produce viable offspring. So why did the Neanderthals go extinct? And humans did not. This is a huge question that people wondered about. And so his work really set a stage for all these other types of questions to be answered. It also set a stage where from the fossil record, not just looking at, at bipedal organisms, you can start to study all sorts of other fossilized artifacts and try to put together genomes. And the relevance and to end with today of some of the cool stuff that he found. And coming full circle, this suite of scientists that had originally, as an undergrad, majored in studies of Egypt and was fascinated with mummies and these sorts of things, and then decided to go to medical school. And then he went on to do a PhD in immunology, secret experiments, and he was able to like have his own lab where he combined all of those passions. It's probably not surprising that. Um, some of the earliest papers about the first of the flu genome and comparing like different severity of COVID, a little hard to see here, but this is our Nobel laureate, Swampe Cabo. He was able to show that in some of the most severe cases of COVID-19, that people could be protected against that by a part of the genome on chromosome 12 and only a portion of the extant human, the living human population today had the right genetic makeup to protect them from the severe form. And he was able to link that back as something that had emerged from that intricacy, which is pretty cool that you can answer this type of question. So the take home message, um, global prices are awesome. Molecular <laughs> biology is awesome. Sequencing is awesome, and immunology is awesome. And as we walk out of the room today, we are offering new parts of the past. All of us likely have some Neanderthal, you know, within us. And you know, why did the Neanderthal go to maybe it will answer that question later in the future? Maybe we won't, but a lot of times organisms go. The thought is that they might be extinct because they cannot fight off the pathogen. And so tying this all together on um, this was I think a financial or a fantastic award for this year. And also the idea that he was able to show that 99.7% of the genomes was the same. Humans, there's a lot of division in the world where people try to make arguments and that we are actually they the same the difference between us is great. Hello, everyone. I'm Max Kovalov. Um, I am a political scientist by training. I teach for the International Studies Program, and uh, I'm going to talk about the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, the Nobel Peace Prize was awarded to one individual and two organizations that have been doing work on um, human rights. 
So these are civil society organizations and an individual who was uh, working, who was, who re was representing uh, civil society interests in Belarus, Russia, and Ukraine. And so to use the words of the Nobel Committee, uh, they have been promoting the rights of individuals and organizations to criticize their governments and protect the rights of citizens. They documented war crimes, human rights abuses, and abuses of power. Uh, the Belarus in Belarus, this is the gentleman on your left. You know, I, I have a picture of, uh, of him, uh, well, not as a caricature. Uh, but it's uh, Alex Belatsky. Uh, he was uh, the founder of uh, uh, a civil rights organization, uh, Vesna or Spring, uh, that has been uh, in existence since 1990s. Uh, the Russian Human Rights Organization Memorial uh, won the Nobel Peace Prize. It's, uh, this, this organization is, has been uh, in, has been founded or was founded in 1987, and the Ukrainian Human Rights Organization Civil uh, Center for Civil Liberties. Uh, so again, uh, one individual and two organizations uh, all have been doing work on uh, pr to promote uh, human rights and uh, to promote civil society efforts. Now I want to start by um, kind of talking about civil society. What is a civil society? Um, generally, when we think about uh, our our life, where we uh, you know we, we we go about our business, we we live. There is a government. There is individuals. There is uh, some kind of economic activities that people in, are engaged in. And so political society usually represents activities of you know, government officials. So government organizations that are part of this political society, elites, political elites, political parties. Uh, economic society are uh, those organizations that belong to the economic society are economic, that are driven by the economic uh, interest, by profit. And civil society, uh, that's the realm of ordinary citizens who join organizations voluntarily without seeking either political power or economic profit. So again, it's the realm of ordinary citizens. It's people like you and I who join organizations because uh, they have interests, desires, wills. They want to associate uh, with uh, each other. Can, can you raise your hand if you are a member of a club or an organization, student, athletic, uh, uh, book club, religious organization. So you are all members of civil society. Uh, civil society organizations are formal memberships and uh, and people, and those do not have to pursue political goals. Uh, civil society institutions do, do seek in political influence and they do need economic support to run their activities, but they're not pursuing political power or economic profit as their goals of their existence. And uh, why does civil society matter? Uh, students of democratization like myself are thinking about civil society uh, at least from the perspective of uh, three goals or so why civil society is important for democracy. One, uh, civil society institutions have impact, positive Im impact on their name, on, on, uh, on their members. So when you are, when you're meeting with each other, with other, people and when you're members of a club or of an organization, you develop certain skills, skills of tolerance, understanding, and you're not, you essentially developing uh, skills that are essential for a functioning democracy. Uh, you, we, we are developing skills uh, to make sure that we disagree. We don't necessarily have to agree with each other, but we disagree in a, uh, in a, in a, in a way that we do not, in a non-confrontational way. Uh, so we're learning uh, uh, these elements of, of democracy and uh, civil society organizations were referred to as schools of democracy. Um, so they develop democratic cultural tolerance and bargaining and understanding, negotiating. Uh, and uh, uh, some people uh, think about civil society as uh, their activities broaden the participation of individuals and kind of uh, uh, the, the, the sense of, of individual sense self and then they turn I into we. Uh, so it, it's when people join organizations, they develop these uh, ideas of associating with each other and understanding and, and dealing with each other. So that's one of the uh, positive impacts of uh, civil society on democracy. Another one, uh, civil society is a bar barrier to tyranny. When, civil, when people organize, mobilize, they put pressure on their governments, they hold their governments accountable. 
Uh, Alexis de Tocqueville wrote that civil society is the only means of preserving freedom. Uh, Philip Schmidt wrote uh, that uh, civil society organizations are reservoirs of resistance to arbitrary or tyrannical action. And John Stuart Mill was distinguishing between governments, uh, government power and uh, civil society power. Governments were the realm of coercion, civil society organizations uh, were the realm of freedom. So uh, finally, the third goal or the third sort of uh, positive impact of civil society on democracy is advice that civil society, society organizations give to governments. And usually imagine there's gonna be thousands of organizations so they compete for their influence. Uh, but uh, so not necessarily one piece of advice will be taken by, by a government. So essentially civil society organizations are uh, crucial for democracy. And when we when we think about, and, and it's actually, it's an essential element of democracy because when we think about uh, freedom of association, that's a, that's one of the elements that defines democracy alongside, alongside with uh, freedom of expression, voting rights. So uh, associational autonomy, the ability of citizens to join organizations and associate with other citizens is an essential aspect of them and, and a defining aspect of democracy. A couple of examples of civil society activism that I, I want to bring. Uh, so maybe some of you have heard about uh, gender rights uh, movement, uh, gender rights organizations. Uh, in Ireland, in the build up to the 2018 uh, referendum about the constitutional uh, provision uh, to recognize the right for abortion for women, gender rights organizations were one of the main drivers beyond this movement. So they were putting pressure on the government, they were mobilizing, they were uh, running campaigns. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, since 2018, abortion has been recognized in Ireland as, uh, as a right. In 2020, Argentina's Congress uh, legalized abortion following a long uh, battle, a long campaign by civil society organizations that uh, have been kind of reaching across the aisle, have been re uh, trying to bridge uh, uh, ideological differences. In the uh, left top corner, this is uh, uh, one of the rallies from the Mothers of the Plaza de Mayo or in Argentina, or uh, also known as Mothers of the Disappeared. In the 19, 19, late 1970s, um, mothers of disappeared children started mobilizing as mothers. They would um, march to the main streets, to the squares uh, of then authoritarian Argentina, and they were holding placards of, about their disappeared children. And that was giving that, them legitimacy. Uh, it's difficult to arrest the mother because uh, she came there to protest. Um, so difficult to suppress. Uh, civil society in Eastern Europe uh, are generally considered to be weak, or civil society efforts. Um, and then there is a number of reasons that have been kind of uh, used to explain the weakness of civil society in post-communist Europe. Um, the, the big reason is communist experiences. Uh, so communist experiences that, uh, you know, the, the, the mistrust of organizations that citizens developed over time, the friendship networks that citizens developed over the years and that kind of transitions uh, into the post-communist period that served as a sub- uh, uh, substitution for civil society, formal civil society um, activities. So the story here is that civil society research shows that civil society in post-communist Europe is weak. And yet, over the last several uh, decades, uh, civil society organizations, specific uh, organizations, uh, were putting pressure on their governments. Uh, even before uh, the collapse of communism, uh, the civil society, the labor union, independent labor union was uh, developed in Poland, uh, the labor union Solidarność or Solidarity, and that labor union was uh, an independent labor union. People wanted to stop police brutality, they wanted to have the right to strike. Uh, there was, and then later on, there were, there were some negotiations that were happening with the communist government that led to the uh, ban, to the official ban, legal ban of this organization until 1989. The organization was revived and then it, it was started putting pressure on the communist government again. Um, 
And then uh, the organization of poor or resistance uh, was very prominent during uh, in the year 2000 when they were putting pressure on Slobodan Milosevic and so uh, finally ousting Slobodan Milosevic uh, from power. Um, these organizations are, uh, uh, of course, the, the ability to put pressure on governments, especially on corrupt or authoritarian regimes, is uh, you don't just, it, it's not enough to have efforts of uh, civil society organizations, but those efforts to mobilize are essential. Uh, in the 2000s, there were some, uh, there were other uh, attempts uh, to kind of put uh, by by civil society groups to put pressure on uh, uh, semi autocratic governments. Uh, civil society was credited uh, to mobilize uh, efforts uh, in uh, during the Rose Revolution in Georgia in 2003, during the Orange Revolution in Ukraine in 2004, and during the 2013 Euromaidan protests in Ukraine. So a couple of words about the, the winners uh, of the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, Alex Velatsky, uh, Alex Velatsky uh, uh, is uh, currently serving a prison term, or he actually is in detention. Uh, he is uh, an activist, a civil society leader in Belarus. Um, he founded an organization just now, or Spring, in 1996 in response to a controversial constitutional amendment that was offered by then. President Lukashenko, so that was 1996. President Lukashenko is still in power, 2022. And um, uh, so this organization was promoting democracy efforts, promoting peaceful development. And over the years, this organization uh, under his leadership developed into a broader human rights organization. The government, the Belarus government uh, has been trying to silence him all, a year after year and then uh, after the, in, in 2021, he was arrested. Uh, and now he's tried, uh, uh, he's accused of financing anti-government protests in 2020 in, in Belarus. Uh, and as of January 5th, uh, he was setting trial and then he was, uh, 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 he was, uh, he was, he was on, on trial. Uh, the uh, organization Memorial in Russia is, uh, uh is also under, um, uh, or it, or it's, it's the civil rights organization that won the Nobel Prize. Uh, and this organization is a human rights organization and has been conducting campaigns to uh, investigate uh, human rights violations and past crimes. Specific, they started with Stalinist crimes during the Chechen wars. They were investigating Chechen war uh, crimes. And one of the leaders of the memorial in Russia, uh, Natalia Estimirova, was uh, was killed actually for for her activities. Um, the Russian government uh, ruled uh, called the memorial organization, this civil rights group, uh, as a foreign agent. And in uh, 2012 and in December 2021, memorial was shut down by the by the government. Uh, they did arrive. They did come to uh, to receive the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, Anis Belatsky was not allowed either to travel or to send a note. Finally, uh, Center for Civil, uh, Civil, Civil Liberties in Ukraine. This organization is relatively new, has been in existence since 2007, but has been working on human rights and democracy in Ukraine. Have they, they have been documenting disappearances of people, uh, journalists, activists. Uh, they have been providing active counsel to protesters during the 2013-2014 protests in Ukraine. They have been uh, monitoring political persecutions in, Don in uh, the, 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 the Crimean Peninsula that was illegally annexed by Russia. And they also have been documenting crimes in eastern parts of the country in the area of Donbass. Um, so finally, I want to say a few words about controversies because uh, uh, controversies are, are always exist with no, Nobel Peace Prizes. Uh, so for one, uh, uh, I, I, obviously, so the governments do not uh, do not like really their Nobel Peace winners because, especially authoritarian governments, especially when government uh, your efforts are or your organizations or individuals are challenging government power. Uh, Jan Raczynski, who has memorials, uh, was told that he should deny or she, he, he should reject the prize because the association with uh, the Belarusian leader and the Ukrainian civil rights organization, that's an inappropriate association. 
um, Alexander Matvichuk, who heads the Center for Civil Liberties, uh, was uh, she actually refused to do the interview with the Russian organization because she wanted to put to make it clear that uh, we are at war with Russia. Russia has invaded Ukraine, and we want to make sure that we highlight human rights violations in Ukraine. Although she does treat uh, Memorial as a friendly organization that is pursuing a, a goal that is uh, admirable. Uh, so she uh, appreciates the, uh, the work done by uh, others. So uh, I'm going to stop here. And then if there are any lessons, um, if you are in Russia or Belarus, do not win a Nobel Peace Prize because you are most likely going to either be in jail or will go to jail. Thank you. Now we're going to come to our second friend, Shelba Laurie, today. Um, we heard about Ananaste in physics, and now we're moving on to Aniando, so the second French um, prize of the day. And I'm just going to introduce you briefly to her work and her corpus, which obviously we can't go over the 20 novels, plays, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that she has written. Um, I put the title of this particular compilation of previously published text. It's called Écrire la vie, writing life. And so just keep that in mind um, as you hear a little bit more about Annie Arnaud. So Annie Thérèse Blanche Arnaud, née Duchesne, was born in France on September 1st, 1940 in Lillebonne in rural Normandy. She grew up in a working class Catholic family in nearby Mito. She later studied at the University of Rouen to become a school teacher and wrote her first novel while in college but publishers rejected it for being too ambitious. It wasn't until she was in her 30s, married with two children, that she took up writing again. And most says she took to writing her personal experiences because a book can contribute to change and enable beings to reimagine themselves. Her literary career thus began in 1974 with the publication of Les Armoires Vides, an autobiographical novel about obtaining an abortion when it was still illegal in France when she was 23 years old. She wrote the book in secret, saying that her husband had made fun of her after her first manuscript, so she pretended to work on a PhD thesis to have time alone to write. The book was later transferred in, sorry, translated into English as Cleaned Out in 1990. Her breakthrough into the mainstream came with her fourth novel, La Place, A Man's Place. Published in 1983, the short work explores her father's life and their relationship. She found broad commercial success in France in 1992 when she released Passion Saint, Simple Passion, a book that detailed her affair with a married foreign diplomat. Erno didn't gain much recognition in the English speaking world until her 2008 memoir, Les Années, The Years. Shortlisted for the International Booker Prize in 2019, Les Années documents her own life and French society at large from the 1940s to the 2000s. Notably, Ernaud wrote Les Années in the third person. This book won the 2019 Warwick Prize for Women in Translation. A feminist icon and a prolific author of some 20 plus novels, Ernaud's writing is heavily drawn from her personal experiences of class and gender often casting a critical eye on social structures. She has excavated her own memory of growing up in rural France to blend autobiography and fiction in, many, in much of her work. She has often resisted, however, labeling her work as either fiction or nonfiction. She dissects the most humiliating private and scandalous moments from her past with almost clinical precision. I shall carry out an ethnological study of myself, she wrote in her 1997 memoir. That was shame. And most writing has spoken particularly to women and to others who, like her, come from a working class seldom depicted with such clarity in literature. The experiences she wrote about in the 1980s and the 1990s, the unwanted pregnancy and abortion, her love affairs, her ambivalence about marriage and motherhood, were considered shocking by social conservatives, but resonated deeply with a broad readership. Erno has described her writing as a political, one meant to reveal entrenched social inequality. She was influenced by Simone de Beauvoir, the sociologist Pierre Bourdieu, 
and by the social upheaval of May 1968, when there were weeks of demonstration strikes and civil unrest in France. She has described her prose as brutally direct, working class, and sometimes obscene. Her work is woven from intensely personal and often ordinary experiences. When Max Mann, the secretary of the Swedish Academy, announced that decision to honor Erno, he lauded, and I quote, the courage and political acuity with which she uncovers the roots, estrangements, and collective restraints of personal memory. According to French writer Edouard Louis, Erno upended assumptions about what literature could be. He says, she oh, didn't try to fit into existing definitions of literature of what is beautiful. She came up with her own. Her original form of literature that is not quite out of fiction and not quite memoir um, inspired French President Emmanuel Macron to salute, salute her achievement on Twitter by commenting that, for 50 years, Annie Arnaud has written the novel of the collective and intimate memory of our country. Her voice is the voice of freedom, of women, and forgotten figures of the century. At a news conference at the Paris offices of her publisher, Gallimard, Erno, 82, promised to keep writing. She said, to receive the Nobel Prize is for me a responsibility to continue, to show some sort of justness, justice with the world. She feels compelled, in particular, to keep examining the inequality and struggles that women face. Speaking from my condition as a woman, she said, it does not seem to me that we, women, have become equal in freedom and power. Since 1901, the Nobel Prize in Literature has been awarded to a writer who, in the field of literature, produced the most outstanding work in an idealistic direction. Annie Alno is just the 17th woman awarded the Nobel Literature Prize since it was first handed out in 1901, and she is the first French woman to win one of literature's highest honors for her body of work, thus joining the ranks um, of 16 fellow countrymen, including Albert Camus and Jean-Paul Sartre who earned the Nobel Prize before her. Her work has won numerous national and international awards, including the Monodo Prize, the Marguerite Duras Prize, and the Warwick Prize previously mentioned. And Erno has another book coming out in English this year titled Look at the Lights, My Love. And it was originally published in French in 2014 as Regarde les Lumières, Mon Amour. Yeah, I'm supposed to spend some light on a very complicated subject, so, uh, but I will try to do it in English because it's better than my French. Uh, let's see here. And also my technological skills are not up to par. To the right. To the right? Ah, well, that's not my slide. Who did that? <laughs> so, uh, briefly, the Nobel Prize in Economics is one of the three economists uh, for analyzing interpreting doing something with what on one hand is absolutely an incredible super product so and then on the other hand a very opaque and difficult process to understand so unlike some of the scientists here we do not do experiments in economics very often especially in the field of money because there's not much we can do you can't really say well let's try this and destroy the world and see what happens <laughs> now we have done that but it's not as part of an experiment, it was an event. And in order to understand the event, we have to understand a model. And so we do a lot of model building as a result of that. And to try to interpret the event and go forth and maybe not do it again, but we seem to repeat them on a regular basis. So um, that's one thing. So the subject of the three Nobel lists this year in 2022, Basically, I have this issue. So the college Charleston uh, finally gave me a salary this month, and that money went into my bank, which was nice. And so there it is. And then uh, presumably, I will be able to draw that out and pay for my utility bills and my food and everything else, and the money will be there. But the problem is my colleague, Dr. Lewis, decided to come in, and he decided he wanted to buy a house. And so he took out a 30-year mortgage. So what did the bank do? Well, banks don't just sit on money. They're not 
you know, storage units like self-storage on Highway 17. You just don't open up a vault, put the money in, close it, and that's it. They had they lend it out, so they lend it out to him. And being, you know, upright, forthright, honest, and everything else, he will pay it back in 30 years. But my utility bill is due this month. And so that's a dynamic tension in banking that's existed forever. This is nothing new. And so banks typically always have to balance between short-term demands, the deposits, long-term lending, and everything else. Now, unfortunately, he decided to abscond with the funds and go to South America. <laughs> now what happens to my account? Now, if it's only one, that's not a problem. If it's massive, it's the problem. Or worse, uh, he has some uh, downfalls financially, decides he wants to sell the house, which is fine, but it sells for a much lower price and he doesn't receive enough income to pay off the loan. And now we're up the creek without a paddle, so to speak. So uh, that's kind of generally how banking has always worked. And historically, you know, some of us seem kind of trivial in some sense. If you like spaghetti westerns like I do, which are famous movies uh, made in Spain. But uh, you always had the bank in the Western town, the United States, and everyone running for the bank saying, there's no gold in the vault anymore, and taking the bank or tar feather and then running about the town. And so that's called a run on a bank. And so that's, that's one aspect that I want to set up for. So that's kind of a trivial historical part. There's another aspect of this in that banking has gotten very complicated in such as banks as financial institutions now in all sorts of forms and shapes and sizes. And one of the things that we have to realize is that most of us don't engage in the flow of finance that goes on. But right now, there are billions of dollars moving from one place to another for all sorts of reasons. And if that flow stops, a lot of bad things happen. So, the retail stores on King Street, they borrow money to put their inventory. And if they can't access finance to buy the inventory, they can't make the sales. Boeing needs to borrow money in order to buy the parts in order to make the plane. If they can't access the funds, then they have a major problem. And so anything that would stop that process creates a dynamic we do not want to see. So the first First, I want to talk about. Oops, wait a minute. It's not the order. Uh, all right. Well, okay. Well, it's there. Yeah. Well, anyway, those are the three that I was going to talk about at the end. All right. So oh, they're there too. Oh, okay. That's nice. Um, the famous classic run on the banks was the 1930s, which was during the Great Depression. And this is an example in New York of everyone standing in line trying to get their funds out of the bank before there is nothing happens. For example, I have just now indicated publicly that you know Dr. Lewis is not going to be able to pay off on his loan. The bank doesn't have any money, and you're going to beat me to the table before I get there so that you can get your money out before I do. And that's what everybody's trying to do. And that's exactly what a run on the bank is. And this happened in the 1930s uh, during the Depression, and it, it, it elongated the Depression, it created a lot of problems, and that particular financial disaster is what motivated one of the novelists to spend a lot of time on monetary history to analyze this to understand the institutions of what's going on. In other words, what can we do to make sure it does not happen? What, what was wrong back then? Was it just everyone collectively made the same dumb mistake? Now, we're not talking about people absconding with money like this guy at FTX with crypto. I mean, that was just, you know, it's basically, you know, getting the money and he runs away. That's a whole different ballroom. This, this was, these were legitimate financial institutions doing legitimate financial transactions, doing what they were supposed to be doing, and all of a sudden all had pro loose and the whole economy collapsed. That's a problem. So in the 1930s, it occurred. And then the question is, could it happen again? And the next major one is 2008. Could it happen in the United States? Could it happen anywhere? This is Hong Kong in 2008. A run on the bank. It looks the more, you know, all in line, waiting nice and patiently. And as the newspaper reported at the time, 
This run on the bank was caused by malicious manure. Money in there. You guys all run down the bank real fast. So if I hadn't said that, then that's the fear that there was nothing there, everyone lines up together. And of course, they don't have it because they lent it to someone that bought a house. They lent it to someone that bought an airline fund. They lent it to someone that started a business. And maybe those are all legitimate and good cross things to do. They don't have to cash that. Where else could it go? Like Cato. And everyone queued up next to they're doing Britain, waiting for lines, get their money. Uh, the guy, the person at the end of the line, that's a, you know, an interesting problem. You know, we don't want to be the last one in line. And then the classic one was Lehman Brothers in the United States of 2008, which was a major financial calamity. This is why I keep saying it's not just white banks. Lehman Brothers is a, uh, a financial institution, so it's known as an investment bank. Yes. You could open up a checking account with Lehman Brothers. You could also open up an account to uh, sell a stock in your company you just wanted to start up. You could borrow money to start up a major business. You could borrow money to get a car. I mean, it, 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 it's a combination. It's both investment banking, commercial banking, the whole thing. And what happened was, um, because of that, and all the obligations, um, one of the oldest realized that the flow of funds, all these billions of dollars that are going, it's all on computers now. So the Federal Reserve can actually watch it and they can say, uh oh, nothing's moving right now. This is not good. And tomorrow morning, we better have some liquidity. Nothing becomes a problem. So a very well known economist comes to the rescue, and here we go. Pedro, <laughs> south of the border. If you've been up in, in the interstate, south of the border is a kind of the kitchen thing that's between North and South Carolina. The billboards start, what, about 100 miles on either side of the road. It's cute. It's like the old Burma shape things when I grew up. And then they have all of that. Well, what's really important is Ben Bernanke's from Dillon, South Carolina. He worked at South of the Border during, during high school and when he was in college. And that's, you know, He's a homegrown person from that respect um, from South Carolina. And he spent his career looking at the 1930s and what was going on with the banking industry and trying to model it. So when he was at the Federal Reserve in 2008, but when this banking collapse hit and Lehman Brothers closes, got problems, and they had this full of funds problem, he said, we have to open up the spigot. Otherwise, everything's going to fall and so he's credited for coming up with the history, the modeling to do that. And that's the whole purpose of why he got the Nobel Prize. The other two people, oops, I guess I gotta go back here to find them. Douglas Diamond and Philip uh, Dupnik, they created something called the Dupnik Diamond Model and uh, for any financial institutions. So I do, the guy think does all sorts of things. He does incentives. He looks at insurance, he looks at stocks, he looks at all sorts of financial institutions, not just banks. Now he predominantly looks at a bank, but it's always a different bank. But the Dyer Diamond model, they're looking at a model of like, can we create a model that generates this problem so that we understand what's happening? And, and that's kind of what, that's why they receive the Nobel Prize. Thank you. I don't know if you've been spending any time any questions. Okay, any other questions? Any other questions? Uh -oh. Is there a, a, an anti Nobel Prize given to the people who caused the problem? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, well, Bernanke would also get it. <laughs> that would be the problem. I mean, there's nothing fraudulent went on on which is bad policy. At least that's my particular interpretation and some other people. 
But uh, the question then is, why did they have them? What, what modeling did they use to create those batch models? And why did they understand this? So they were looking at the facts that were put in this. And you know, in retrospect, I can be right a lot more often than looking forward. So. And I'm going to stand for quantum physics that are going to change with any of this stuff. This is just a general question for the entire panel. I know that a lot of the original price winners have gone through quantum doping this. And that's not that they didn't know if they could do it or they ran into much problems in their life. What do you think kept their motivation going when they were low or they were failing to keep going? So a lot of people will quit or will just find something else with that. So what do you think their inspiration was? Especially when people doubt it. Well, I think in science, um, one of the Nobel Prize winners, David Baltimore, once said that uh, you cannot prepare to win a Nobel Prize. And so if somebody had that as a goal, they would be very, very disappointed in their career trajectory. Uh, probably some of it is you're at the like this year's Nobel Prize winner, you're at the right time time and space for these sorts of things to happen and so all of us get discouraged and like and then some things work out some things don't work out and for some reason what Lord it's in science it's just fantastic when it works out but <laughs> the thing that you wanted to set your goals on winning a Nobel prize and disappointed that it didn't work out for things and I think in literature, it's all about the writing itself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they continue to write. A lot of the writing is done not just with any MO, but it comes from your personal life experiences, whether that comes through in your work or not. And interestingly enough, any MO, her publisher, Gali Brown, told her uh, last year, not 22, rather, the previous year in 21, to be ready. They thought maybe she was going to get the Nobel Prize then, but she definitely wasn't writing to have any. Um, you know, ideal of I'm going to win all, win all of these literary prizes. So I think literature is something that might be more personal, and it's just you're born, I think, with that drive. You're driven to do that, to put those words on the paper. Yeah, if I may, uh, to add a few things about the number of peace prizes, I don't think human rights activists or civil society leaders planning uh, to win uh, the Nobel Peace Prize uh, at the end of their career or in the middle of their career, they did their work. And when, when they do work in, in authoritarian regimes, they, uh, they, they go against severe resistance. So they can be arrested, they can go to jail, they can, they can lose their job, they can be exiled, they can lose their life. Because this is what has happened with human rights activists. Uh, what, uh, but they all realize that the work does not end there with the Nobel Peace Prize uh, uh, memorial organization message after uh, during the uh, ceremony was that life goes on and our fight continues. We're banned in Russia, but our fight continues. I'm not too sure. I, I knowing at least one of, one of the economists, but the historical background, I don't think they had any setbacks. You know, so I mean, they, they, but I, as he was pointing out, nobody planned to do this research to get the Nobel Prize. They were doing good research, they got published, they kept doing research, they got collaborators, and, and they kept going. And, and all three of them recognized as leaders in the field for years. So really, it's just a question of the committee comes up and says, look, we need to you know, order. Well, make an award, who's standing? You know? <laughs> I know when, when the Nobel Prize first came out in economics, really, they, they made a mad rush to get the ones that were feebly standing, that had, had lifetime accomplishments in the 1920s and 30s. So they wanted to make sure that they recognized them before they passed away. But now, I mean, these three Nobelists, you know, they're fairly young. I mean, they're, you know, 10, 20 years at least. So it's just a question of it's time for someone to recognize their work. I wanted to ask about quick chemistry. Sure. I'm a little, like, I'm still not sure what it's going to be doing in the future. What do you predict for it? And is it actually helping us to discover new drugs, or is it really just helping us to take what we already have and be able to produce it more cheaply? So quick reactions, it's not one reaction, right? So that molecule, the molecule that that has to that's called a triazole, right? We, we make them, they have some issues, um, not perfect. 
But you could write if you read your rhetorical a click reaction is written now, which is one written 10 years ago, three times as long. And in half of it is here's all the reactions that we now have to do this. And so the idea, yeah, I guess this is there are a lot of different ideas where you know behind what click reactions are, are are being used. The one example I gave you was, yeah, we took a drug that you know it's called doxorubicin. It, 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 side effects were already unless you unleash it only one thing. They found a way to do that using click chemistry. It pretty much localizes it only at the tumor, at which point it's released into the it's released into those cells. So we really we took a compound that exists that was really good at killing all of those cells, just slowly more of your cancer cells than yours, and now made it so it's way, way better. So it's it's not that I, I think I maybe understated just how you know, effective that is. The first example, that specific click, you know, click reaction is really finding a way uh, in, in that case into, into people, working in people. Um, but there are other fields where I can envision people, and people are, are I don't just, they're not envisioning it, other people doing it. Um, Private based drug design, there are a lot of, you know, lots of proteins, if you interfere with your signaling, right, that's, that's what we call different therapies. The ones on the surface of our cell represent the target of 35 to 50% of all known medicines. Now, there's a whole lot of other proteins you might want to hit, but they don't have a big pocket you can buy. They just have little piece, parts recognized tiny pieces of molecules, any one of which doesn't actually interact with them. But if you take two pieces and link them, all of a sudden you have a very potent drug. That's called fragment based drug discovery. Um, what you don't want to do when you make any medicines is have the reaction necessary and length of the complicated. And there are classes of click reactions being used now to make these conjugated fragments that then turn into more drugs. So that, that is one place where, yes, it's being used directly in the discovery process. I'll just make um, one last comment, um, sort of address. We're saying about more prize winners, and that is if you were noting, right, uh, all of these winners, right, these are not, uh, with the exception of, you know, uh, the Peace Prize that hasn't been around as long, right, some winners of the Peace Prize that haven't been around as long. Um, you know, these are lifetime achievement awards. These are the things that people have done. These are, these are these discoveries that were made 40, 50, 60 years ago sometimes, right? That are then built upon, right? And once you build upon them, you see what others do with it. And so that you understand only over time, right? How influential it was and how important it was, right? Um, and so again, right? So yes, they may have had struggles and things like that, as everyone does. Right? But it really is a something for, you know, it's not that like you did something amazing today and everybody recognizes it tomorrow, right? It's only after time that we understand really fully the importance. Of it. And you know these types of things go on. There's lots of influential people, and you know, how the committees recognize it at the time. I think also is a question of you know what is going on at that moment. Um, uh, you know, and what is sort of um, important in a moment in trying to recognize why we want to bring you know, some of these people into the highlight. One inconsistency I want to uh, point uh, point out there. So uh, the Nobel Peace Prize is for the, the, the committee says that we are going to give an award uh, for, to those who have done the most or the best work for fraternity between nations, the abolition of or reduction of standing armies or holding and promotion of peace in the past year. And yet even in the Peace Prize, it's still an accumulation. And it's a sort of a career award that all, for the, all the work that has been done over the last previous year. So it's, um, it's still a by accumulation, but there is some inconsistency there with the committee of what they announce they're going to do. Well, I'll ask that we take one more chance to thank all of our families. Thank you all for coming out today.